And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us from Media Stream Press, creators of the Demon Age, the 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 apocalyptic, not post-apocalyptic, full-on apocalyptic campaign setting of modern 5e, the one and only Andrew Frinkel. Thanks for having me. It's nice to be here. Thank you for coming on and dealing with time zone hell. Are you in, uh, was it Central? Yeah. Which yeah. Isn't, a, isn't as bad. It's, ju it's just experience. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have, have you done a lot of interviews with, say, like overseas? Say, like uh, England, Germany, uh, Australia? Yes, yes, and yes. Yeah, that, that probably makes things fun, uh, time schedule wise. Um, you're, you're probably dealing on more on their time frame than yours, then, right? Um, because of, because of my day job, I have to be flexible with t with time as it is, which makes things a little bit easier for me. It's just it's just nailing de nailing it down. There are some weird, not quite hour based time zones in parts of Canada that are a bit that are a bit annoying. Oh, um, uh, the new feast, right? Yeah, yeah, the newfies, um, <laughs> especially anywhere around St. John's. Yeah, where the, where it's like an I think there was one that was like an hour and fifteen minutes. I have no idea why. Oh, I know there's a half an hour one. There's a, there's one at a fifteen minute point too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that's that's different, I guess. Oh, work and work and. Sometimes, sometimes there, sometimes there's the weirdness between regular British time and su and summertime, but that's do that's doable. Um, and most of the ones in Europe, most of the time, I'm just dealing with central with um with Central European ta time, so no issue there. Um, it's re it's really on the other side of the Pacific where things get interesting because now you're going over the international dateline. Yeah, for sure. I actually lived in Korea for a few years, and I got family over there on my wife's side. So, yeah, we're used to that. And then sometimes it's 13 hours off, sometimes 14 hours off, depending on if we're on daylight savings times or not. So, it, it does make things interesting, for sure. Oh. I'd have loved to be a fly on the wall during your first experience with kimchi. <laughs> I had it uh, in... St. Pete, Florida, actually. Uh, I knew I was going over there, so I was like, you know, I should probably actually try the food. <laughs> so I, I went to a Korean restaurant here once and then uh, went over there, just jumped in feet first and and went, went through it for about three years and then moved back here. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody did joke, jokingly say, well, well if, if you have such a problem with international time zones, why don't you move, why don't you move to, the, to the UK or something? And my response was, knowing my luck, I would end up getting a bunch of interviews from the states, so I'd be right back where I started. Yeah. But the big tradition around here is the humble beginnings, in a sorts, the origin story. So, with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Sure. Ah. Uh... Uh, back in the 90s, uh, a lot of people are familiar with the board game Hero Quest, and uh, that, that's actually where I started. I remember getting that for Christmas one year, and we just started playing a lot, got all the expansions, started painting the miniatures. You know what the and best that, thing about Hero Quest is? The old miniatures? I, I know. <laughs> More Hero Quest. Yeah, yeah. And, and well, then they redid it. I couldn't believe it. I remember getting it for, it was like 30, 40 bucks back in about 1995. Now it's. It's solid hundred bucks, I think, when they redid it. Maybe two hundred. I mean, it comes with all the minis. It's it's a solid game. It's a good start, and uh, it was my gateway role playing game, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess we just we got limited in the the board 
and, and the board got kind of tiresome, so we started making up our own boards and went from there. And then we had an exchange student from from Norway who actually got to know the, our neighbor, <laughs> and uh, he was uh, big into D and D. So we ended up hanging out in his basement through most of high school playing D and D because of hero quest, which led to. Uh, Magic the Gathering and things like that, and then finally Dungeons and Dragons Second Edition, and uh, we were pretty hooked after that. So that that was uh, that was our start. Uh, we tried a little bit of Shadowrun and Merp and um, uh, Hero Heroes Unlimited, but it was r really Dungeons and Dragons for the most part. How many pounds of dice? <laughs> uh, you know, actually. Um, I guess through high school I, I didn't have a lot of money so I had like one solid set and it was like the the throwaway set where they had lost a few pieces and so we got the like the discount set from the hobby shop so I, I lived on one set of dice for a long time and um, now I don't know uh, maybe like a couple pounds maybe <laughs> I mean it, which is uh, nothing crazy uh, but uh, I'm still a cheapie I don't think I've paid more than about five bucks for any set of dice ever the, the the actual answer is not enough. <laughs> yeah, but I, I mean, I am certainly eyeballing some. I did a uh, Kickstarter about two years ago, and I worked with Norse Foundry, who is local out of Fort Myers, Florida. And man, the the stone ones are just something. So, but there's actually I know there's certain DMs who actually refuse to have metal or stone dice on their table because they're too clattery and loud when they, or you have to roll on a pad. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't know. I was eyeball, eyeballing some of those bloodstone ones or the other stuff. I mean, they're definitely pretty, but I just can't pull, bring myself to pull the trigger and spend more than five bucks for a set of dice. Yeah, yeah I just had to make the joke because everybody knows you at, you end up rolling d6s by the pound in Shadowrun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, well, that's interesting too because I mean, I'm looking at. Uh, I'm working on a couple projects where I have to come up with uh, a new system, pretty much. And you go back to the, is it going to be a D6 or a D10 or a D20 system? And it's hard to get away from the D20. It really is. But I, I'm aiming at a D10, and there's a couple good D10 systems out there already, so I might take a couple hints from them. But yeah, the D6 system is pretty common, too. But I think that was more common back when people didn't have as much access to dice. They could just go raid Monopoly in their game, board game closet and steal... 20 d6 or whatever right yeah i mean um it's better it's better to use those d6s in a game that's going to keep friendships not end them <laughs> so have you lost friends over Shadowrun? i plead the fifth <laughs> um yeah i don't know if i've ever lost friends from from gaming uh We've definitely broken into arguments before and ended campaigns, but it, and it usually ends with, "Well, if you if you don't like this, well, why don't you DM?" Okay, I guess I will. So, uh, <laughs> Obvious, obviously, obviously, I'm pulling the proverbial leg because there's there's always those games that e that either start fights or or end friendships. There's the there's been the meme for the longest time that Mario Kart ends friendships. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, and it's a highly competitive game, you know. In the in the same vein, I've I've been campaigning for the last twenty or so years to have Jenga be be recognized in the Geneva Convention as a form of torturing non-combatants. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a fun one. Uh, but have you ever seen like the the two by four version where they have a, at like a, I don't know, like a bar or something, and they've got like the jumbo Jenga. Yeah, I've seen that. Um, it, it makes quite a clatter. I, I, I injured my child playing that because it tipped over and it was as tall as her. Uh, she was, I don't know, like four at the time, and you have this three-foot stack of wood tumble over. Mm -hmm. uh, I not, not, not seriously injured, but, you know, when you have 10 pounds of wood fall on you, you're not usually happy. Yeah, and I've... The only reason I the only reason I can't pass too much judgment is because is because of some of the stuff that I've been I've been hit I've been hit with during the brief time I did stunt work. Oh yeah. Uh, oh. So role playing is probably a safer gig then. Yeah, it's um. Well, one of the one of the, there was an indie film I was in, I was in a long time ago, and one of the scenes we had to film was a bar fight, and um. 
Some idiot forgot to gimmick the bar stools. They were wooden bar stools they were supposed to gimmick so that they'd break easy. Mm. Um, somebody forgot to do that, so I got hit hard way with <laughs> with a, with a, with over a dozen bar, over a dozen bar stools over the span of three days. Yeah, the breakaway furniture is probably preferable in that situation. Yeah, because um, I I got hit with those. I got now the they they did glimp they did gimmick the glass bottles so they're using sugar glass so that so that it breaks easy and it hurts less. But the key word here is it hurts less. It doesn't not hurt. I didn't know they make those out of sugar. I mean, I mean it makes sense, but I, I never I don't know. I just didn't research it or hear much about it. So it's. Uh, that, that's that's cool to hear. Well, the, it, there's a reason. Wh- there's a reason why um, the whole why it's a, why it's tricky to to um, to use it to use a real glass bottle for the whole christening of ships thing thing that thing that's done whenever a new ship is he- is heading out. Yeah. You know, because if you la- if you launch the thing against the bow and it doesn't break, it's bad luck, and. <laughs> This has lived rent free in um in the naval communities' heads so much that special bottles are made that are that have thinner glass just so it will be easier to break. Yeah. Makes sense. To me I always worried about breaking it and then having it split up and cut your hand if you broke it wrong. You know, because you, you don't know that definitely only the tip's gonna break off away from where you're actually holding it, right? Well, in the case of christening for ships, they dr- they drop it from a they drop it from a um while while it's hanging up while it's hanging on the thing from like a rope. Ah, so it swings down pendulum style and smashes. Yeah, well, it's supposed to smash. Sometimes it doesn't. Oh, um, supposedly the Costa Concordia that sh- that ship that that cru- that cruise ship that caused a ma- that caused a massive shitstorm over in Italy. Um. It di- it didn't. Then again, that, and of course, of course, this kind of thing happens on the 100 year anniversary of the Titanic. Yeah, uh, but I'm not superstitious. Yeah, but a lot of fishermen are, uh, or fishermen or sailors, etc. Uh. Have you ever heard the expression "There are no atheists in foxholes"? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think I don't think that. That I don't think a saying like that is limited to, um, to so, to soldiers. Hell, even even fans of sports teams have their own superstitions, because ev- everybody has that. Every sport has that one team that everyone swears is cursed. <laughs> well, eventually they'll break it, wasn't it? Uh, the Red Sox had the curse. Red Sox, so- Red Sox, and Red Sox had the curse. Cubs and um, too, yeah, and Cubs were cursed for decades because of that Billy Goat. Um, if I have to use a racing example, I'd say the Andretti family. Uh, since Mario, huh? Yeah, because because of the falling out with his crew chief and Mar- and Mario's wife had had said you will you will never you will never win the big one. And two generations later, that's still that's still <laughs> that still is. Basically, you will never. The curse was you will never win um, at Indy. Yeah. And Mario didn't, and none, and none of his kids have ever since. Yeah, I, I don't know how many. I guess their role players are somewhat superstitious. What with the uh, the dice jail or the dice timeout and stuff too. So. Um, the guy who trained me. Had this had this rule where he would outright refuse to use anybody else's dice but his. Yeah, I could see that. I guess I, I was watching my daughter. We were play testing something the other night. She had a D10 because we're trying that D10 system, and she, every single check she would get seven, eight, ten. Every single attack she rolled a one, and it was five times in a row. I was like, All right, we're gonna try a different die, and I gave her uh, the the mate of that die, which was another uh, translucent purple D10, and she rolled another one. Right. <laughs> you've probably you've probably heard of the legends about Will Wheaton being cursed when it comes to dice. Well, uh, I hadn't. I mean, I know Will Wheaton's a big gamer and stuff, and uh, 
I've watched a couple of his streams where he does uh, card games and stuff. I don't. I hadn't heard the dice thing though. Um, the times that he had been on Critical Role and the times that he's done his own thing, for whatever reason, dice got the dice gods hate him. Um, at a panel once, somebody asked somebody asked Mercer how, how you how you explain um, that, and he he ended up ranting for about a minute about how there is no there is no explanation. Because no matter no matter what, he always rolls bad. It's e it's either in the single digits, <laughs> or he, or j or nat one, or nat ones. But it is always a always a bad roll, and <laughs> no one can no one can explain why. I have had I have had the joke that it's karma catching up for him for all those years as Wesley. Which <laughs> he gets real yeah. mad when that gets brought up. Or with yeah, that, that, that character got a lot of hate. Between that and Stand By Me, I think, uh, yeah. Uh, I think there, I think there was one character who was who was equivalent in Doctor Who who also got a, um, yeah, Adric. Ad, it was Adric who got a lot of hate for similar reasons. Um, and for me personally, I've always had the thing of I don't hate the. Nine times out of ten, I don't hate the actor; I hate the writer. Yeah, or even the the character or the show it, it eventually, but, you know, but usually but not the actor. Yeah, usually the actor is just doing what they can, and you can't make chicken salad out of chicken shit. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I'd, he really didn't do a lot of more acting, though. But I mean, there were a lot of other people like that, where like Jake Lloyd from Star Wars and. Uh, I feel definitely bad. a few poster I feel children. Bad for, I feel bad for Jake Lloyd. He got way more shit than he deserved. Yeah, I, I think that was above and beyond what Will Wheaton had to deal with, for sure. I mean, it, not that Will had an easy time of it, but man. Yeah. So, shifting into that, when it comes to the Demon Age, was this a cam was this a campaign setting that you had that you had already been playing in your own group and just decided to expand upon it, or was there a different origin story to how it came about? So I uh, I had a large group in high school. Uh, we, I would DM for up to twelve people at a time, and we would just take set like take turns because they would always split the party. So you'd have a group of four, a couple groups of three, maybe a two and a one because some guy has to go off solo. So we would do a lot of that. So when I moved for college and I moved to Florida, I lost my whole group and I started playing on IRC instead. Um, that we had an IRC channel that we would run through. And we would chat and use dice bots. It was, you know, the the precursor to what a lot of people are doing now, I guess. Um, I mean, sometimes we'd share images and have websites for maps and stuff. It was pretty cool. But so it was about 2000, 2001, I believe. I wrote this story or the start of it. And uh, <laughs> oddly, uh, so I was hanging out with a bunch of goth people online too. So what I wrote this story of a modern. I mean, it was kind of urban fantasy before urban fantasy became a real thing, I guess. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there was some 20 years ago, but I, I don't think it's it was as big as it is maybe now with, say, like Dresden Files and whatnot. So we had uh, the Demon Age, we started, and a lot of the people from the Gothic web website or channel, they ended up being characters and they loved it. So, so they ended up being demons here and there. And we played through, and it, it was it was fun, and it, but it was a lot simpler than what this was. So going back to it and expanding it from what was a few fun sessions of Freeform or with Dice Online to what is now a 400-page tome with a 50-page add-on for the player-facing guide, it's a it, it's definitely gone uh, undergone an existential and just kind of evolutionary change for sure. So, with that in with that in mind, mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to when it came, when it came, I think one of the first one of the first things to uh, to ask is you you refer to it as mo as modern five E. So, is it is it mainly a case of just bringing the core rules in, into the mo into the modern age, or were there were there um were there cert were there certain mechanics that were that are in 5e that were either going to be questionably 
um, compatible or just incompatible? Um, so that was another thing too that we were going through. That's a good question. Um, so when I had started it, I was basically going to make everyone essentially a fighter or in some cases say like a dumbed down ranger or something like that where they didn't have spells and stuff. Uh, going back to more of like a 2E feel where not everybody had magic abilities because in 5E almost every class has some ability to have some kind of casting. I mean for the most part. So stripping that out a couple of our writers were concerned that that was just changing the identity of 5e too much or I mean I, th I think there is a case that could be made if you took away some of the magic it could still work for sure but you'd ha and then you'd have to change some of the feats to make more sense in a in a modern situation but a lot of them you could change uh, it, I mean, you've got a sharpshooter it doesn't matter if he's shooting with a bow and arrow, or if he's shooting with a, a handgun, right? I mean, that those kind of abilities translate fairly well. But other ones, like the magic, I don't know that they translate quite as well. And I had compensated for that with adding some angelic abilities. Now, without giving too much of the story away, but I mean, not any more than this, probably on the, the Kickstarter page already. But So you end up playing one of the Nephilim, mm -hmm. and as you progress in levels, we've added an extra mechanic where you, it's called Angelic Awakening, and you, you start with 10%, and your goal is to get to 100% by the end, at which case you get this existential question, do you want to go toward the dark side or the good side? And so you would have an awakening where you'd get kind of a very, very Dragon Ball where you're leveling up or going to the next step. So. But the angelic awakening is also giving you abilities that are somewhat martial but also psionic so i was using that as a replacement but there were still people in the writing group because there's like 14 of us that really wanted magic and they thought we could do a lot with the the modern twist to the magic so we ended up doing that and we ran with it and we ended up making i think it's 80 spells so we tried to take modern takes on things and things that would influence technology or pop culture or pull in more relevant cultural or just situation all spells for right now versus uh, the, like the stock spells that are in the book. So I, I, I think a lot of people can get away with playing like a rogue or a fighter, but you can definitely We've added the resources where you could, for sure, try to play a like a caster type class. Some of them might be a little bit harder to make as much sense of, uh, but for sure, I, I think adding those in could make it fun. And even hybrid classes where you're a fighter that has a couple spells as an option, mm -hmm. but they're neat modern spells. Yeah. Um. From. Although this this may be a blessing in disguise because, well, the the ranger has ha has had a checkered history, even going all the way back to AD and D. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I like. I remember seeing it in first edition, and then a little bit of second edition. I do have a copy of the first edition books in the closet, with all the other uh, uh, the role playing stuff. Well, because, but, um, because of how Th because of how Thaco worked, and the fact that they couldn't equip heavy armor, they could be ridiculously squishy. It's theorized that they're the reason for at death's door rules in third in third edition and death saves in fifth edition because Ranger Down became a running joke. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I don't know. I I don't know a lot of people that played them so much. Uh, I usually played a. a fighter rogue kind of a multi-class kind of thing um, very swashbuckly kind of characters and kind a of medium to light armor goofing around causing trouble uh, but yeah the encumbrance rules while they make sense they they're definitely different than say like a video game where you're almost better off slapping on the heaviest armor you can find and tanking through well like I said we can with the with the way Thaco with the way Thaco worked, um, the he the heaviest armor the heavier armor the better. 
because especially when it came to especially as you got as you got further up there there was kind of the expectation that you would be getting heavier stuff whereas the ranger um would not would not so they so because of how the whole thing worked it would become really easy to get hit yeah um, and i plus there's the issue of a lot of their kit being outdoorsy in a game called Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> <laughs> the Cavalier had the same problem. That's the reason the Cavalier didn't last. Yeah, I remember those. It, but I think they were, let's see, were they D12? I know Barbarian was D12 and 2E. Uh, um, and I think Cavalier might have been too. I don't know. I'm trying to remember. Cavalier wasn't, it wasn't in 2E. Um, Cavalier, one of the guidebooks that went out. Uh, well, at least, at least not in core. At least not in core. As far as whether it's in, whether it's in one of these splats, um, low bar on that front. So, it, so I'm not saying it. What? Not saying it's not. I'm just saying, um, just about everything was in the splats, and I don't feel like looking through all all of mine to see if I'm to see if that was right. Um, it just what it just was moved out of core. And for for good reason because when you when your a lot of your kit revolves around you being mounted on a horse, kind of hard to do that indoors. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, I remember looking at some of those. It, Barbarian seemed like the way to go a lot. In uh, was it two e or was it? Ah, it's been so long since I've looked at those books. Two e or one e? Um, I think it was two e. Oh. Uh, just just for the extra hit points and some of the extra, they didn't have as much like the rage type stuff in there. I don't think originally. No, though. Um, barbarians in AD and D were a gimped ass fighter. Yeah. Because, uh, well, the even even with some of the benefits that they have, not being able to. Not being able to use any magic items and being compelled to destroy them if possible. Until you're un I mean you get you get potions at you get potions at level two and most magic items available to fighters at level ten. Yeah. But um and there, there was, there was a fighter kit that had berser that had berserker, aside from that added the rage thing. But it, but it took you psyching yourself up for ten rounds. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of prohibitive. And I was just trying to quickly look and see where I, which book I had been reading. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it was the Unearthed Arcana in first edition. But that's the the one. That's where I, where I first pulled out Cavalier, I think. Uh, but yeah, so it wasn't something I played with that much. It was just kind of a cool resource. But yeah, I, I don't think anybody I knew ever played much of that. We had a couple people who liked the ninja or assassin style rogue kits and stuff, but hits were kind of all the rage, I guess, in 2E. Yeah, for for bet for better end for for better end for worse. Um, and I think, but with that with that in mind, in your case, you have you have a di you have um the differing between class and profession. So I'd I'd like to go into what the what the line is between the two. Sure. Uh, so you're still going to choose a class in the Demon Age, just like an, an, you normally would, but a lot of these people are supposed to be. Uh, someone who say maybe had an extra ability or you know that ESP kind of sense of some sort, but they generally lived a normal life. So we added profession as an extra bonus or extra training that you would have had prior to starting your career as this demon hunter. So if you were like a teacher or something, you would have pluses to a couple stats. A little bit your choice, and then also you could choose a uh, uh, like a a skill or two to get some bonuses on. 
So, and we had about 20 of those. So we tried to pull in something. So maybe a fighter might naturally have come from like a police or security background, whereas a rogue might have come from maybe a hacker or something like that background. So in whereas wizards would probably technically be something more in the, I don't know, say like a research or scientist that field. So we wanted them to reflect that kind of training that they had prior to becoming uh, this demon hunter. And also, it maybe it cranks them up a little bit. They have a little bit better on skills and slightly better stats than they normally would. And some of that's a survival survivability issue, but also just as a character development. I mean, it's just basically a character background. All right, that can certainly make sense. That can certainly make sense. But the other the other thing the other thing that's straight on the character sheet that I was curious about is um, fervor and dread. Okay, um, so those are pretty key. So fervor is kind of I, I think the with the advantage and disadvantage or the the inspiration kind of thing in D and D is a little on the weak side, personally. I mean, it's kind of cool, but just being able to get you know a bonus on a roll is not that great. It's not that impactful. I mean, if you save it for the exact right moment and you have a crummy roll and you can get to re-roll, you know, good on you. It, it, it helps a little bit for sure. But uh, so what we did is we took fervor and dread. Dread would be sort of a situational thing, trying to pull in, say, like Call of Cthulhu with the with the the madness and all that stuff, where. The more spooky, scary the situation, the more negatives you might pull up, making it harder to survive that situation. But fervor works as the opposite. So you might be ga gaining dread going through a, a dark subway trying to creep up on some beast that you've never seen before and you suddenly get attacked. So now you're getting negatives on certain roles. Not highly negatives, but you know, a, a minus one here on skill checks or on saves, which could possibly turn the tide against you. Eventually, if you got to the full seven, you would be uh, incapacitated. But uh, hopefully you're doing something to counteract that effect, like resting, or uh, there could be spells or abilities that help bring your dread down and or increase fervor. So fervor is the opposite of that. Uh, maybe you see one of your buddies fall in combat and it just gets you really fired up. So your DM might give you a couple points of fervor. So fervor would give you extra abilities that you could use situationally to really turn the tide. So, and again, this was something that we had intended to make make it more like cinematic and dramatic as you're going through things. So spooky stuff gives you dread, and you're like losing, and you're getting more. It's getting more intense. But right when in the battle needs to turn tide, you might pick up some fervor and use that to finish off a bad guy or save your fallen friend or something like that. And instead of having something as simple as, well, you get advantage or disadvantage on this, that's not that impactful. You actually have a, like a menu of options to choose from. And you can use and save up those fervor points and uh, spend them at a more key point in the story, hopefully. Mm -hmm. So with that in, with that in mind... Um, something else I found kind of interesting. What is the mission sto mission story arc relationship to levels? So yeah. what? So as I understand it, the Demon Age, in, in addition to in addition to being a campaign setting, is it is meant to be a multi level campaign? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you would play through the story starting at the at there's 14 chapters and it's written as a story and each story or each chapter rather takes you to a different city in the real world but it's kind of an alternate history where things have been tweaked a little bit we threw in some mythology and theology and came up with, with a reason why there's demons walking the earth and you can definitely read up on that and it, if if people are interested in that i had a couple people in clergymen that we talked through this and tried to come up with you know, a, a good reason for it, not just like, hey, let's uh, let's have some demons walking around. But, I mean, we pulled in some theology to make it make more sense. But um, 
Yeah, so so you're going to go through the 14 chapters, starting with a prologue in Chicago, and then you're going to go to uh, Philadelphia, and then you have choices to go to Toronto or Vegas, and you end up walking on almost every continent before it's all done. And we basically set up the chapters as like a milestone. So instead of using XP, we have more of a milestone-based leveling effect. So as you finish each chapter, other than the prologue. The prologue is meant to build you up to speed, and that could take multiple sessions, and that could very well take you from level, say, two to level five, six, seven, which would make it survivable as you actually go face more difficult enemies. And by the time you're done, you're probably going to be somewhere between level 18 to 20, depending on how much your DM is leveling you up, or what challenge level, or potentially even the number of players. Yeah, I, a lot of stuff will be, have to be scaled. I mean, if you're only playing with three players and maybe an NPC, it might be a lot harder than, say, if you're playing with five or six players. And uh, so they can scale that or let you level up at different points. And then each time you level up, you also get to increase that angelic awakening I talked about before, mm -hmm. which will, again, give you access to more spell-like abilities. So there's a, there was a lot of abilities thrown in, again, instead of magical spells. Not that we don't have spells, because we have 80 of them from Cantrip to level 9. But those I'm hoping to use a little more sparingly because you don't really need a, 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 like a magical fireball spell if you've got a flamethrower, right? Or you don't need uh, you no know, magic missile if you can pull out a shotgun. So, I mean, we tried to, not that you can't use both too, but we tried to mash up more modern technology with some like angelic or um, magical abilities or things like that. And again, some spells as well, and magic items for sure. So you've got a a pretty wide arsenal, I think, between yeah. mo modern weaponry and mythological items and such. Mm -hmm. Now, this is why I find it interesting that you represented Angelic Awakening with a percentage, because there's a couple of things that Im that immediately came to mind. One is the set is of course the old sand check in. Um, in Call, in Call of Cthulhu, where when it's low, it's easy to it's easy to lose. Sand. When it's um high, it's easy to lose sand. But when it's low, it gets harder and and harder to lose it. Yeah. But the other thing that I end up that ended up coming to mind, and I'd be shocked if nobody had brought this up to you. Are you familiar with the game Cult? Spelled uh, with a K. No. Uh it sounds familiar, but I haven't, like I said, uh, my role-playing is mostly in a D&D &D or a couple of the Palladium games or whatnot. I, you'd have to tell me about that one. I, oh. I, there's been some people pulled up references to uh, in, in Nominee, but not Cult, I don't think. I haven't heard that one yet. I can see why they'd bring up in Nominee, although I, th I think the... The connective tissue there isn't quite isn't quite as strong. It's just you're de you're dealing with demon you're dealing with demons and the end of days and all all that. That's that's where it, that's where it kind of begins and ends. Um, Colt has been nicknamed by some people as Call of Cthulhu, except you can win. Um, <laughs> it has a lot of ties to Gnosticism, and there is the idea of of an ascension mechanic. Although it's although it's an, a very expensive path and and one that you're one um that as you do it you're going to become less and less human in the process. But that sort that sort of approach is something that came that came to mind. And given given the fact that you're that you're assuming the martial classes, um, walk me through how walk me through the relationship between. Angelic Awakening and how you actually acquire new spells. Okay, so uh, so you start at 10%, and every time you hit a new 10%, you get one of these Angelic or Nephilim abilities. And so you choose that from a menu. Some of them are recharge abilities. Some of them are uh, just like permanent stat boosts. Things that make you a little more... Again, survivability is pretty key. Because it, especially for the the lower end missions, it, some of the creatures can be pretty nasty, and 
I'm trying to get you through the story without a, you know, a total party kill, but it could happen. <laughs> uh, but uh, so you you added these extra abilities to to help out a little bit. But then every time you go up a level, you roll another d10 and you add that to your percentage, and minimum of six. But it, so you get the the better option. So you roll the d10, and so it's six or up pretty much. The the point. To, is to get you to a hundred percent by the end of the story to give you that choice. It's that's part of the story arc, and then you get to choose between your angelic ascendance or a demonic descent. And even though that might very well screw up your party, if, if one of you goes one way and somebody else goes the other way, mm -hmm. but but that ties into again the religious background uh, or the theological background part of the story and the nephilim. Mm -hmm. And with within that within that, mm -hmm. um, now when it comes when it comes to in, when it comes to increasing that awakening, is that is that going to be something that's largely in the hands of the GM? And how how would you range that this in? Because and the reason I ask that is. I w is um, you know how there's kind of advice about how much XP to give out play give out players in GM sections in a bunch of different games. Sure. It's in the same category as that kind of question. Yeah. So I do have guidelines in there. Uh, again, so you, every chapter, so there's 14 chapters. Mm -hmm. So by the time you level up to say level 20, 20 times six, you should be at uh, you know you, you definitely hit 100 percent. I want you to hit 100% by the final chapter, and if you don't, that's kind of kind of written in there as kind of a character wrap up sort of thing. Yeah. Because uh, it, it is the end goal, but sometimes you might get there ahead of time, and if you get there ahead of time, that's fine as well. We also have other things that, that I added as optional rules. So, I, I mean, personally, I don't like the six percent minimum, but we I don't know we we had a long conversation <laughs> among some of the creators. Um, I, I don't know. I, I guess it's maybe it's a, it's a newer thing. It's that random number generation. They're like, you sure you can get screwed rolling a d10. You could roll a one percent. Well, that you're like, well, I just spent an entire one or two or three sessions beating this, and I got one percent out of it. Yeah, well, it's better than zero, <laughs> but but uh, I don't know. And then somebody else gets ten, so they might, if somebody rolls really well, they could honestly hit their angelic awakening and transfiguration by level what 10 15 maybe and other people are waiting to level 20 <laughs> so uh does that buzz kill and ruin the fun of it i i don't know um but I mean, there's definitely other options i put in there so like if you're receiving a lot of say like dread and you still survived it so you're like the overcome kind of situation because if you're at Four, four, four points of dread, it's actually a lot harder to survive. So if you overcame that, maybe you get a bonus when it comes time to level up. So uh, there's definitely options like that you can add in there. But I really want everybody to hit 100 by the end of the story. That's that's the whole point. Yeah. Oh. If it, if it weren't for the path setup, the approach I'd pro that I'd probably end up taking personally if I, if I was running things is to... Is to steal some notes from get from games like RuneQuest and have it that at the end of a campaign, people have to roll D100. If they roll over their awakening percentage, then it goes up by a few points. You know, easy easy to increase early on, but hard but harder to increase um, late game. I I get that. That that makes sense. I mean, it's I mean, just like. I don't know exercise or any skill. It's you're gonna plateau and it's harder to outdo yourself after you hit a certain point. Yeah, um, for sure. Though tr truth be told, I feel I feel that sort of percentage roll would be better used in a situational sense, given the path design that you have here. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, I do find I do find it funny that you you said why why have a fireball when you ha when when you when you can have a flame throw when you have a flamethrower available, yeah. um, the irony of that is that one of the spells I saw on the on your spell list is holy grenade, 
because no, <laughs> because even you are are not immune from a good Monty Python joke. <laughs> yeah, I, how, how can you not? Uh, we definitely have some interesting ones, Dance Fever and uh, uh, M- a Mirror Selfie. We tried to pull in some jokes and some humor in there, uh, for sure. Uh, you know, because you can't you can't have everything super serial. No, definitely not. Uh, fortune cookies. So we get, we have definitely some some goofy things in here. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, one I like the the boys in blue illusion spell where you're just creating police officer illusions and <laughs> I, I mean there's some there's some fun stuff in there. A pizza portal, mm-hmm. um, um. zombie dance party. I mean. Why not, man? That's yeah. Good. Now you have two. Now there are two books that you're d- that you're doing with this. Um, mm-hmm. There is the re- there is the campaign resource guide, and there is the hunter's guide. Though, from what you had shown from what you had shown me regarding the hunter's guide, it's it feels like a in universe journal, the kind of thing I would see in um, in a white wolf game. And I am curious. I know, I know you mentioned having a very limited experience, but have people brought up White Wolf when it comes to some of the stuff? Uh, not much. Uh, funny thing, I actually met Mark Reinhagen uh, back in January, the creator of Vampire the Masquerade, mm-hmm. and a lot of the team. Uh, and and a lot of, some of the pe- writers I am working with are working with him currently through Lost Lorne Games. And so... This is a great time to plug. I'll just throw that out there. But so this project, even though I'm Media Stream Press and I'm headlining the project and putting it together, uh, it wouldn't be possible without a team. And we've got like 14 people putting it together, and several of them have their own little companies: Dark Urban Games, Two Kings Games, uh, Lost Lorne is a, a, one of the bigger groups. And I have I've just it, it's funny, like when you put out an, kind of an all call on the internet, say, "Hey, uh, anybody want to write with me?" and and like it it's kind of cool who answers and then they know people and then they know people and uh, not that it's a a huge viral thing yet but uh it's cool to meet people who meet people who meet people and then you end up hanging out like at a con or something a lot of them are just at uh gen con recently several of my writers uh, are working with uh, their own company or other companies as well Mm. and there's just a lot of them willing to do a lot of freelancing or trading work on their projects and uh, so, so uh, I've not played a lot of White Wolf. Uh, I was like big into the Jihad card game when it came out, which is like a vampire card game uh, based on White Wolf. But that's a lot of my limited experience with it, really. Uh, but, but I think the journal came about sort of as, a, as like a side project and it, it came to life really quick. I had a lot of extra like art I was putting together and I wanted a different look for certain things. And one of the writers I'd worked with on a previous project was like, hey, I can write this all like a journal. And we kind of just hashed it out and put it together. And I, I think it ended up being pretty cool, pretty fun. So it ends up being a player-facing placing journal. And uh, it, it's something that you get in the story at the end of the prologue. And Or the other option is, as you're encountering creatures or prior to doing that, the organization feeds you some papers at a time, giving you some kind of uh, lead-in information. Hey, this is what was written about these creatures, and some of it's semi-inaccurate or vague, and other parts are somewhat specific. Mm-hmm. There's also some scrawled notes in there, kind of graffiti style, that seem to be a writ- that seem to have been written at a different time or by a different person, and some of that stuff might mislead you or even give you some hints as to how to survive fighting creatures. Mm-hmm. I, th- I thought it was a pretty fun way to wrap up that stuff, or like to tie it together. And I, I, th- I think also with 17 major creatures that you'll be encountering, plus the 13 demons, that's already 30 different things. And each of them also have their own individual servants or creatures in those chapters. So, I mean, it's something like 50 different things you might encounter. It, it's just a great place to keep track of notes and add to. And I think scrawling your own notes in there by the time you're done, because that'll be a paperback that you'll be able to pick up, or you can just print it out. So adding to your own notes by the time you're done, it'll have a really cool kind of travel log slash journal slash memory book <laughs> or scrapbook 
as you end up facing all these things. I think it'd be really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, almost like the Book of Eli, if it was better written. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For okay, sure. that, um, okay, that's a little bit harsh. I like I liked the concept. I just didn't like the execution. Yeah, uh, it was an interesting movie though. Uh, but after you know the twist at the end, it kind of ruins it for re- rewatching, right? Yeah, and but the 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 idea of the. I, my in, my introduction to Robert E. Howard wasn't co- wasn't Conan; it was Solomon Kane, and that idea of the of the wandering holy man trying to trying to right wrongs where where he finds them is certainly an interesting concept. And I usually t- I usually tell people um, if you want the best example of a paladin, look 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 at the Pilgrim, look look at Solomon Kane. Oh. But there's, but the idea, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure that it, that given the, given the way that think that you have the campaign set up, um, it wouldn't be out, it wouldn't be out of line to, dis- to discover, an- to discover another hunter's, di- another hunter's diary and use that and use that as a way to inform players about the, about some of the demons and how they might operate. Yeah, especially when they have thousands of years of history. As we go back to just after the flood, the biblical flood, so uh, and that's when they were, they've been on the earth since then, kind of uh, spreading their version of joy. <laughs> and uh, so some of them might, we try to tie in history too, so some of them we use as excuses for certain um, cultural dispositions maybe uh, uh, or or just they were played in certain characters uh, like we have the demon of intoxication that may or may not have been Loki at one point and uh, it, we tried to pull in different mythologies and because if you were basically an immortal being walking around an area you wouldn't always stay necessarily in the same country I mean maybe you would uh, but it would change over time and people's viewpoint of you would change over time and how so and if you and again if you wandered the the stories and legends about you uh, would change and, and, and grow and if you wanted to pretend to be human for a while perhaps you would pick up an identity for 20 50 years and then have to move on just because you're not aging and everybody else is but again, they can also alter their appearance. Hmm. So it, we came up with excuses for uh, why why they're in certain areas or why they act the way they are, or why people view them in certain ways. Mm-hmm. So with, with that in mind, um, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date, just a um, approximation. I can almost give you a date. Uh, I, so when I do Kickstarters, uh, because all of my writers have have agreed to take a piece of the pie afterward, based on the number of tasks or pages they completed, I, I don't pay them ahead of time, and we tend to have a lot of it done ahead of time. But our stretch goals end up being add-ons or extra cool things that we add. Miniatures, extra art, extra spells, creatures. It, it, depend, it depends on the book. And uh, so on this one, I have some editing passes to do. We have maybe about 16 stat blocks to round out. And we're close to done. We're already 400-some pages. The, the Hunter's Guide is already done. I actually have a print copy in my hands uh, like as we speak. Uh, so, we, I mean, we're not far off, but typically the way Kickstarter works, you get paid 14 days after funding. Mm-hmm. After that, I distribute the money to my team based on what they did. I submit probably within, sometimes before that even, uh, so within usually a week to three weeks of finishing the Kickstarter, I've submitted it for print. I get a dummy copy, a prototype, make sure there's no glaring 
problems like, hey, uh, this page is completely missing or screwed up or somehow it just didn't print right, etc. I just you know take a quick peek at it and then it's usually good to go. Uh, PDFs, I, I'm not as picky about releasing because if somebody set catches something, I can quickly fix it and I'll put it on drive through RPG and just say, hey, here's the updated copy. Thanks for catching all the you know, the, the mistakes or errata, et cetera. And that's easy to fix on a PDF. It's harder when a print copy comes out, obviously. Um, oh, yeah. So, so that being said, we wrap tomorrow, and uh, which is very quick. So we wrap tomorrow. Probably about the end of August will be paid. And you probably the end of August, first week of September, we're looking at sending out PDFs and digital goods. Got most of the maps done. Uh, print copies take two to three more weeks to get shipped. And we usually use uh, print on demand through Amazon. So they're pretty quick. Uh, so, I mean, if you're overseas, I've got a couple writers in Canada and I've got one in Brazil. Uh, I had one in Germany, but he moved back to the States. He was in the armed forces. Uh, but so, I mean, we should be able to ship just about anywhere. And I, I hope you have your stuff in September, honestly. Yep. So, I, yeah. and. I don't know. I, I see other Kickstarters out there and I've backed a few and you wait a year and you forget about it. <laughs> and I, I just, I don't want to do that to people. And uh, I, I get it. There's, there's certain things you're willing to wait for, but I tried, uh, I've tried to have everything that we have completed in customer hands in four to six, six weeks, four to eight weeks after, after wrapping. Mm hmm. And like I said, I will be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Well, again, thanks for having me. It was a, uh, it was kind of cool to uh, talk about some of the different games that, again, I, I don't have as much experience as it seems you or a lot of other people have in playing different systems just because we got into a couple of them and stayed with them. But So it's cool to hear things related to, like our project related to other systems or things that maybe it'd be cool to learn about. So mm -hmm. I can you know, do my own take on it later. <laughs> yep. And any t anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often sure. say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope to be seeing you because uh, well, I usually do a, a project, three projects a year, so uh, I'll keep you in mind for the next one. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!